You heard that. I'm not going to be able to. Hello. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to Our Stories Belong to Us, Lived Experience of Death Row, hosted by the Texas After Violence Project. So, uh, again, I welcome everybody that's watching online and who ventured out in person uh, to join us with this conversation tonight. Uh, it's a little echoey in here, so I'm going to ask everyone to, to speak loudly uh, so the people at home can hear us clearly. So to introduce everybody, uh, I'm Jennifer Toon. I'm one of the community advisors uh, with TABP, and uh, I will let each of these ladies introduce uh, themselves. Hello, I'm Pam Carrillo, and I was on death row for 20 years and in prison for 39. Hi. I am Maggie Luna with Statewide Leadership Council, and um, I'm excited to be here. If you don't know me, my name is Maggie. How, how, could, uh, how could anybody watch it not know the three of us up here? Um, <laughs> because when we talk about criminal justice and somebody mentions women, uh, we're all over it. So what brings us together for this discussion today? Well, you know, if you've been following the news, uh, Carl Wayne Button is the oldest person on Texas death row, and he is scheduled to be executed on April 21st for an offense more than 30 years ago. And Melissa Lucio, a personal friend of ours, uh, and, and we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into both of these cases, but she would be the first Latina put to death by the state of Texas, which is scheduled for April 27th. Now, every death penalty case which is what we refer to as a form of state-sanctioned violence, is important in each case calls into question our morals and ethical responsibility as citizens and really challenges our humanity. For example, with Carl in a statement uh, when he lost his appeal, uh, U.S. Supreme Justice Steve Breyer, he said that Button's lengthy confinement and the confinement of others like him calls into question the constitutionality of the death penalty. And with Melissa Lucio, we have tremendous um, questions uh, about her guilt. Uh, we have federal judges, five jurors who have now um, included the foreman who, uh, who convicted her, and a roster of family, politicians, celebrities who believe that there are real doubts about her guilt and that the state of Texas is about to execute an innocent mother. So, as we get started, um, I would like to give a little introduction uh, to Pam, and then we're going to get into some, some really great discussion questions. So, Pam Perillo, a good friend of mine, um, spent 20 years on Texas death row. She was first sentenced to death in 1980. In 1984, her case was overturned on appeal, but she was sentenced to death again after her second trial. That second sentence, sentence was also overturned on appeal, and Pam chose to plead guilty rather than to go to trial for a third time and risk death again. She was sentenced to life in prison, but was finally able to obtain parole in 2019. Uh, and and I, I want her to share with uh, all of us what the parole board said to her one time about what she should just be grateful for. Um, I think that's impactful. Um, while she was incarcerated, became Pam became a Christian and devoted her time to serving others. She trained service dogs and worked as a peer educator. That's how I met Pam. Since leaving prison, Pam has advocated for an end to the death penalty and for the freedom of those wrongly convicted. Pam's journey is a testament to the intrinsic value of human life despite the mistakes that we make and our inherent potential to change and be redeemed. Uh, there is no greater example uh, from all my years of time than Pam Perillo. So, Pam, let's start off with this question. And I think this is so important what you can share with us. As a woman who has been just two days away from a set execution date, I want that to really sink in. Pam was two days away from her execution date, uh, two, ways, two days away from death. Um, what emotions are you experiencing right now as the dates for Coral? especially was a, a, a woman who was at Mountain View just like yourself. Uh, what, what emotions are you feeling as those dates get closer? 
my heart just goes out to both of them, Carl and Melissa. Um, I'm not real sure how it is for the men prior to their execution. I know for the females, you're usually on death watch 30 days before your execution. And there's certain protocols um, for all of that. But um, I know it's hard for the girls that are there with her. Uh, when my best friend Carla Faye Tucker was executed, it about I felt like somebody had reached in my chest and took my heart out. It was very hard. I grew up on death row with her. And I know um, for a fact that the ladies that are there with Melissa right now are going through a hard time. Um, so for her, the protocol is going to be the warden is going to sit down with her and ask the what color clothes, they wear bench work clothes when they're executed, what color clothes do you want, um, who do you want to pick up your property, where do you want your body delivered. Um, it's a very eerie thing and I'll never forget because my 16 year old son was sitting there with me when these questions were asked. Um, it's, it's a hard process and at that point in time when I went through my date and I got two days away from my execution, I was ready to go. I felt like my life had been on an emotional roller coaster. And it was just a relief for me to just go meet Jesus face to face. I was just very tired. And I know this has to be very tiring for Melissa. She's had a lot of publicity. Um, a lot of people out there fighting for her, especially her son, John. He is going all over the place speaking out for his mother, and I just admire him. Well, and I'm glad you said that because it kind of leads into the next thing I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, giving us insight, you know, to, to how the, the men, in, in, you know, you, you can only speak for the women, but I, I'm sure it's very similar. What the people on death row, when one of their own has a date, and what what those emotions feel like, and uh, what the, the other people on the unit feel like. I, I know I was about a few, and um, I was, you know, I was talking to, to Amy the other day, about, you know, when we're there, we kind of, to survive, it just becomes a community. And we go to chow, we go to church, and we dropped off the books to death row and kind of snuck hello to the girls. And, and the word death, the words death row, it was pretend. It, it, it just, we just blocked it out. It was just a label for, for where y'all were housed, right. right? And what, and I think Maggie can agree, is that, as this has gotten closer with Carl uh, and, and certainly with Melissa, um, it's it suddenly feels like, oh God, wait a minute! Those same people that called our chow, um, that asked us if we had a good visit, that stripped us out, and you know, the maintenance bosses, you know, everybody at the unit that there was this. Let's just pretend we're a little, little so secured, safe community. It's like, wait a minute. And kill one of us. You know what I mean? And I, you know, I have no other way to put that. And it, it's kind of like the reality of that finally sunk in. And every time I think about it, and I think about how close you were, um, I, I'm just horrified. And I say this a lot. This is like if they would kill me or Maggie or Lori or any of the women I know there. And um, so, you know, just explain a little bit more uh, what you experienced as, as Carla's day got closer. You know, it's, and it's not only the inmates that go through the, a lot of these officers that, you know, and they'll say it's their job, and it is their job. Um, a lot of the officers and even the wardens, they spend years with us, and they get to know us, and then they have to execute you, and they have to have officers that are right there, and the warden, Warden Baggett knew Carla very, very well. And when she came back from that execution, she said, I feel like I just killed my own child. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for her. And the officer that had to go sit with Carla outside the death chamber had to take a leave for therapy after that. It's hard for them to, it's hard, like Jennifer said, the people in population, 
And I asked the warden one time, why do they keep death row inmates separated from population inmates? Or why can't we have a job and go work with them? And she said, because if they get too close to you and you have an execution day, it could cause a riot on the unit. And that's true. You know, they, they could. And a lot of people got to know Carla in 14 and a half years, and they were very upset. You know, they had a special chapel uh, togetherness with uh, different ministries for when Carla went through her date. And um, it was very hard. It was the first time a female had been executed in the state of Texas in over 100 years. And the first one before Carla was uh, Chapita Rodriguez, who they years, years, years found later she was innocent. You know, so, you know, it was like a, I was talking to somebody earlier and um, I was saying that they have executed a lot of innocent people. And it's like, well, how many? Well, it doesn't matter how many. One is too many. Mm -hmm. One is too many. You can't bring that wrong back and say, oh, we made a mistake. You know, it's, it, well, one is too many, and uh, I'll never stop fighting for uh, the end of uh, the death penalty ever. You know, it's just wrong. And yes, we make mistakes. Um, I was guilty of my crime. I wasn't innocent. I was guilty of my crime. And a week after my crime, I turned myself in. And my confession is what got me the death penalty. Uh, being a part of uh, my crime with two other people, my part in that got me the death penalty because I said what I did. Um, and no, it doesn't make it right, but I'm not a cold-blooded murderer that just goes out killing people. I. Um, got involved with people I didn't know and traveled with them and we got involved with something that was terribly wrong and I paid the consequences for it. I didn't die like they wanted me to, but I stayed in prison for 39 years. And it's hard. It's really hard. Thank you, Pam. And, and so, <laughs> that's a long time. That's almost my whole life. <laughs> that's a long time. And, uh, you know, you were denied parole several times, several, several times, yeah. um, despite uh, not having any disciplinary and showing that you were rehabilitated, which is that's what the system wants us to, to do, right? And can you just share uh, what I believe it was the commissioner said to you, what you should just be grateful for? Yeah, I had seen parole seven times, and <clears throat> honestly, I never thought I would get out. Uh, very seldom does somebody get off of death row, let alone go through free will. It's just pretty unknown. But uh, when I saw a parole commissioner, I think it was the sixth time up for parole, and he told me, well, Perello, if you never make it home, just be glad you're still breathing. And I am glad I'm still breathing, but it doesn't mean that I don't want to go home. You know, I have a family too, and. It's, it's hard, um, but I really truly never thought that they would let me go home. It was a total shock. I almost laid down and passed out when I got a, e a JK saying, congratulations, sis, you got an FI1. Mm -hmm. I just could not believe they were going to let me go home. They did, and I'm glad I'm here. We are too. Um, you know, if the state would have gotten their way originally and put you to death, all the lives that you changed through your testament, your story as a Christian, as a, as a beautiful soul that you are, all of that would have never happened. And that's the part of healing that we are trying to accomplish by ending the death penalty. So um, thank you, Pam. Maggie, so tell us what inspired and motivate, motivates you to work to end the death penalty and what about Carl's case and certainly Melissa's case that speaks to you personally? So um, when I got out of prison this time, I met Anthony Graves. 
And I was living in a treatment center with no, not even knowing where I was about to go. And Anthony came and told his story about how the state of Texas took 17 years of his life, gave him two death dates, <clears throat> and he was innocent. And uh, just to see how he was using that experience to help other people, really, it touched me. And he is the reason why I'm here today, because he showed us videos of him testifying in front of Congress and talking about the solitary confinement and death row, wrongful convictions, and uh, you know, just to, to see him today and see all of the wonderful things that he's doing, um, that really like started me thinking, okay, so we're, 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 we're human, we're all human, right? Um, and we make mistakes, we make terrible mistakes. Um, how can we pick and choose who dies and who doesn't, you know? Um, and then, so when Melissa's case came into my orbit, I, the reason why that touched me was because I'm a Hispanic female, um, I had a family in the Valley. I had three children and I was caught up in my addiction and I could not handle three children. And I remember days that I was fighting myself about my addiction while I knew I had children to take care of. And that could be me. You know, anything could have happened and I could have been blamed for anything, you know? So Melissa's situation at that time is so familiar to me, you know? I didn't have 14 though. And, but I, I had three. And I had one that was speeding the younger one, Tabasco, because he said a bad word, you know? There's, but he didn't, he wasn't even talking yet. But <laughs> these are what they were doing to each other. So I couldn't imagine having 14 children you're under all of this poverty and you can't figure out how to feed your kids and on top of trying to feed an addiction. Um, and then to see all of the injustices that she has faced from day one, you know, um, I mean, they looked at her, as soon as they saw her, they already knew what they were gonna do. They never gave her any kind of chance they didn't give her proper counsel they didn't she every miscarriage of justice that you could possibly think of is wrapped up in most of the case and so my daily fight is to end mass incarceration right and we're always trying to bring forward this is why the system is not working we're always trying to enlighten these situations but you can see it all in one case right there with Melissa Lucia, with the confession that they claim and the fact that her co-defendant got four years and he's out free. I mean, and then when I heard DA signs the other day, <laughs> just totally act like it's not a big deal. And then, you know, he was like, well, what about Mariah? He doesn't know that that family goes to visit Mariah's grave. They are trying to put a headstone on there for Melissa just in case she does get executed because that is her last wish because she cares about that baby. Her brother puts flowers there, you know, so don't say that nobody cares about this victim. <laughs> there are 14 victims in this you know, and if John has to go watch his mother be murdered by the state of Texas, what justice is that? I mean, I just, so this has just drawn so much attention to all of the systems that need to be fixed. And to see this bipartisan support for, to actually like pay attention and see what's going on, 
this has just driven my like, yes, you know, uh, we need to stand up and we need to tell people what's happening instead of getting out of prison and then just saying, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Because we did that for so long and it continued to happen. And the higher ups were saying, oh, well, everything's running fine because nobody's saying anything. Well, now we're going to say something. Y'all are killing innocent people. Y'all are ruining lives and then expecting public safety. I mean, I, I just don't understand. I, I don't understand that. How can you ex say that you are for community safety when you are traumatizing 14 people right now? And if you murder their mother, what's going to happen then? What's going to make this community safer then? You have 14 vengeful, angry, <coughs> hurt people. So it's just common sense to me. And I don't know much about Carl's case, but it, like I just said, who are we to choose who lives and who dies? We just signed a bill, a heartbeat bill, where all of these people stood up and said they care about heartbeats. On TV, signing with these big smiles that we're pro-life, but yet we want to kill these people because we are God, you know? We don't get to choose, you know? No matter what they've done, you know, I've done some terrible things that I didn't get caught. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of things that they didn't get caught for, you know? And uh, so, I mean, this is just not justice, it's vengeance and it's, it's ruining society as a whole. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Maggie. I, I think all of us um, on this panel can say and, and testify to to, that violence didn't heal our hearts. It, it didn't heal us um, when we were in our darkest place and, and carrying the, the burden of where we were and the things that we've done. And, um, you know, <laughs> people kind of come with, come with the argument, well, the death penalty is to be a deterrent, right? I know no one in the 20 something years that I did that they said, oh, I thought about it. And um, <laughs> yeah. just, I knew they were gonna give me the death penalty. So I didn't do that particular thing. I said, it, it, when you are in that state of, you know, right before your offense happens, um, whatever trauma you're in, you are in such a dark space. You don't care about anything. You don't care about your own life. You don't care if you live or die. You are so, at, at least for myself, when, when I was uh, in those moments right before my offenses, I didn't care about the threat of prison. I didn't care about the threat of the death penalty. I just, I didn't, I was so broken. So how, it's never seemed like it would be something as a deterrent, mm -hmm. right? So um, let me ask both of you ladies, because this is a panel of formerly incarcerated women, and I, I really want to highlight, um, as usual, I always want to talk about the differences between men and women uh, and the inequality, especially in the criminal justice system. So uh, do y'all think that women are held to a different standard when it comes to uh, crime and incarceration. I think in the beginning, yes, um, as they got more into no gender, um, especially in GCJ where, you know, an officer filed a lawsuit because he couldn't work a certain area. So um, they came up with this thing, okay, well, there's no gender anymore. So the females were able to do the same thing the males were doing, um, even the strip searching. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the whole thing with the prison system was mainly the rules and the protocols and all of that were mainly made around the men. Uh, I remember they used to come uh, strip search us every day they pass, take us out of our whole clothes, strip search us, put us in a white gown, open the door. No, they had us step out of the cell in our panties and bra, open the door and escort us to an empty cell, put us in there so they could search our cell. And I filed on them because of that. And um, they said there's no gender in TDC no more. So. 
the protocol was the men were to be taken out of their cells in their underwear. Well, men and women are different in their underwear. A man that has a pair of boxers on looks like he has a pair of shorts on. A woman has on a pair of nylon panties and a bra that you can pretty much see through. And so there is a difference. Um, but again, they were treating the females as the same as they were treating the men. And, um, and that was one of the things also that was brought up with Carla's execution date. The media turned it into a circus. If the men are executed for the same thing the women are doing, or the women are doing the same crimes the men are doing, why shouldn't we execute the women? You know, so, yeah, I think it's, um, a lot of what the females go through are based on rules for the men. Right, and, and our needs are different. Yes. Right, and, and I think one of the legislators, uh, Representative Leach, had, you know, commented that they were all able to go in and sit with Melissa and pray with her. And he said, you know, I don't understand. We have all these strict protocols uh, that she's a danger. She hasn't been able to hug her, her children, uh, touch any other human being um, other than medical staff and the correction guards to a very limited ability. He said, she's not a security threat. And, and perhaps, you know, when you look at violence in the, the physical violence in the men and women's facilities, it, it is different. Um, you know, Maggie, what do you think? What do you think, Maggie? So there's a lot of differences uh, that I've seen, and um, mostly like during uh, my work, I've heard of this. Women were an afterthought. Prisons were created to lock up men, and so. They don't know what they're doing, so they're scrambling and trying to get women equality. And uh, I feel like when it comes to sentencing, women are held to a higher standard. Um, and I always say this, I did a year for less than a gram, which is smaller than a sugar packet. I know men who have gotten 15 felony cases before they ever did. The time is now 7.30, the library will be closing in 30 minutes. Public internet stations will shut down. So they would have like 15 felonies before they ever did any substantial time, you know? Um, and that was my second felony. No, no, no. I mean, it was, look, I, I did what I did, and I did my time, so. <laughs> but. I do think that my sentencing was harsher than it was not only for men, but also for other women who had money. Yeah. And so, um, and, and that's one of the main things about the system is you can be safe if you have money. If you don't have money, then you're a danger to society. And so I couldn't bond out. So I had to sit there and accept whatever they gave me. Well, more dangerous people bond out and get five year resets. And, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. What kind of justice is this? What, I mean, I don't know who they're keeping safe, but it's not me and it's not my family. So, well, no, you, you answered it perfectly because, it, especially in terms of sentencing, and it was kind of explained to me. Uh, one time by a staff member when we were talking about it is like, you know, men or boys will be boys. That's, we just expect, which is, is really sad, a society belief that, that men, you can just expect them to be, you know, violent or, you know, whatever. But how dare women, how dare women have trauma and depression and mental illness and that they're not in the kitchen baking cookies and, and you know, for their kids. And it's like, how dare she have anger? How dare she uh, be something outside uh, of that? And I feel like the system punishes women for that. Even with a preconceived notion, I, I feel like in Melissa's case, that you know, with the, the trauma and they had already made up their mind just because she didn't fit that mold mm -hmm. of what a woman and a mother is held to oh, this yeah. high standard. And you know, you hear, 
Yes, she was negligent. Yes, she had a drug problem. But she's done 15 years. I mean, come on. You know, uh, there are mothers out there. I saw them in this grocery store dragging their kids by the hair. You know, they're, we're not giving them the death penalty. Um, we're not taking their kids. I don't know why, but um, what I was going to say is that, you know, women, if we bleed on our clothes in prison, which are white, you cannot hand wash your clothes. You get a case. You get a case if you use a tampon for anything other than what it's supposed to. Use a maxi pad. We use them for cleaning sometimes. That's a case. But men do disgusting things and they don't get cases, you know? And so it's just, it's mind boggling. And, and perhaps that will be for another discussion <laughs> about how different, even inside prison, uh, disciplinary is so drastically uh, disproportionate between men and women. There's a great study that a woman did in the eighties from the University of Texas still holds true. Great study by NPR. Uh, so let's move on to some other questions because I heard the library uh, magical person above us saying that we we need to get on about our business here. Um, so let me ask you, how, Pam, how do you feel like, how does the death penalty affect the community as a whole? <laughs> Well, again, I'm going to go back to Carla because Carla was like the poster child for the death penalty for females back then. You know, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of publicity. They used different things, her Christianity, the fact that she was a female, um, all kinds of things for Carla. And I know that a lot of people spoke up and uh, was fighting for her, even the Pope, you know, um, what do they call that over there, the Parliament? Mm -hmm. Them. Uh, a lot of people were talking up for Carla. Yes, she never denied her crime, ever. She, she admitted to what she did. And, but she changed. There, that's my big thing, is people change. Mm -hmm. I was 24 years old, crazy, wild, on heroin and methadone, and I could care less about my own life, let alone anybody else's at that time. But I went to prison when I was 24. I had just turned 24. I got out of prison when I was 65. Um, I grew up in there. The whole time I was on death row, I worked. We don't, death row inmates don't have to work. You know, we're just being housed until the state of Texas kills us. We don't have to work, but I did. It got me out of my cell more. It got me around the other ladies that I lived with more. And it was just past the time better to work. When I got off death row and I went to population, I got involved with whatever I could get involved with that made me better. I did groups, I did Bridges to Life, If Truth Be Told, anything in there that they offered to make me understand me better, I got involved with. I became a peer educator, not because I knew anything about being a peer educator, but the I was very shy and withdrawn, and I didn't know how to talk in front of people. And being a peer educator brought me out of myself, and it made me be able to speak better in front of people. Then I got involved with the dog program. It's Patriot Paulus out of Rockwell, Texas, and we train service dogs for disabled veterans that need mobility assistance or they have PTSD or they have TBI. It was an amazing feeling for me to train a dog, a $36,000 dog, that was going to make this life better for this person. I had a little girl stand up one time and said, thank you for giving me my daddy back. He was hiding in the closet. He had such bad PTSD. I've seen people that 
didn't have arms or legs, to be able to use a dog to pick something up or to go get a phone or go get a remote or get a ball out of the refrigerator. We taught them to help make beds, to help you put your shoes and socks on and off. You know, it's amazing what these dogs can do for these people. And I worked with them for seven and a half years. So that it helped me even more. And it gave me a, a career to work with out here because now I can train basic training. I won't train a service dog again, but I could, but I can teach a dog how to not jump on you or to sit or go down or wave at you, whatever. You know, it, it gives a smile to a person. Um, so I think uh, just being able to do things in prison to help yourself. I did not walk out of prison the same crazy young girl I walked into prison. I never had a job my whole life. I, I was a stripper at one time, but I got paid under the table, so it wasn't known as a job. I never had a social security. I got that in prison. When I was born, they didn't give them to you like they do now. You have to apply for them. I never had a driver's license. I never had a job. I didn't know how to write a check. I never had a bank account. I never lived by myself in my whole life. And now I have all of that. I have a credit card, I pay my own rent in my own little duplex in a senior facility place. I write my own checks for my rent. I do things to help people understand out here why the system is wrong and why the death penalty is wrong. And it just makes me feel like I'm giving back. I give my testimony a lot um, at NAs and AAs and celebrate recovery in different churches and organizations that ask me to. Only because I think that knowledge gives power of understanding. If you understand why a person did what they did or why they got in the situation they got into, I will never forget what I've done, ever. I remember when I went to trial and I had to watch my victim's family come in there and the loss that they lost and the grief that they felt and the hurt they felt. I can never give back what I took, but I can give back to society and, and give back of myself. And it doesn't mean that it makes it right or it makes it go away, but at least I feel like I'm giving something back. And so, yeah, I think people change and we need to give people the opportunity to change and to know that people on death row change, you know? And everybody says, well, they still did the crime, they need to do pay the consequences. I watched my son grow up behind a piece of puffy glass for 20 years. I never even got to touch him. And he was one when I went to prison. And that's hard. It's hard for us. I didn't have a child crime to be restricted from my son. I had a, a crime that put me on death row to where I didn't have a right to contact him. You know, so, I mean, he's my best friend. He came to see me every, every month and we grew up, he grew up uh, knowing all about me. And today he's 42 years old and we're best friends. Um, but yeah, people change and I still want the death penalty and did <laughs> Well, for all the reasons you just said, Pam, and yeah. what I hear Pam saying is that a lot of when we, when we have people that, that are not on death row anymore and they're able to give back, it's healing for the community. All the work that you've given back, like you said, you've never forgotten about it. But when we, when we have the death penalty and we have these executions, it just perpetuates the pain and the anguish. And it, it really doesn't allow the person that wants to be held accountable 
uh, for what they've done to be able to give back and create that that healing. So it was so powerful that that you said that. Um, Sister Perdini, who I'm sure everybody knows, and then the fights the death penalty. She says that we kill people that kill people to show people that killing people is wrong, but we kill people. Exactly. And uh, how nonsensical and uh, backward and ineffective that has proven to be for uh, the state of Texas, for sure. You know, Maggie, um, I'm going to kind of end us on this question so we can uh, hear one of the letters and poems from Carl. And, and I want to say, um, you know, with Carl's case, here is an elderly gentleman, gentleman uh, that has been on death row for 30 years. And you were talking about earlier about public safety. And um, he has certainly paid his dues about his offense. Uh, but where is the public safety in executing an elderly man? And uh, I really look forward to, to hearing his letter and his, his poetry. Uh, but again, I hear the voice of the, the, the library god saying us to, to come on with it. <laughs> so, um, you know, you mentioned early, earlier about why it's so important to share and own our stories. And that's what our whole panel has been about, sharing parts of our story, especially Pam offering hers to us. So why is that so important? Because if we don't, somebody else is going to tell it for us, right? That's right. And, uh, you know, all we're doing is violence. When, when is the violence going to stop? Each one of us who are being judged for whatever we've done have been through something. I don't have time for me to tell you what I've been through, but the violence has to stop somewhere. And as many people who have wronged me, and I have so much love for these people because I know Carl had a bad life. I mean, and I feel for him and his victim because we are called to love all of our neighbors not just whoever we think is worthy. So I think Linda should. Wait, one second. I really want to hit something you just said um, before it leaves my, my brain. Uh, my, my attorney told me when I was 15, that was the, my first incarceration. Um, you know, I remember him laying out the, our defense and I remember <coughs> thinking, well, doesn't it sound like we're telling the jury like, like we're making excuses for what I did? And he said, I want you to remember something. There's a thin line between a reason and an excuse, right? So I, I think that's really important. And Pam said it earlier, is that when you understand, right, what a person, what brought a person to that place for them to do something like this, whatever the offense uh, is, and certainly people who are innocent, you know, that, that's different. But for those of us who are guilty, you know, understanding what brought them to that helps you be more compassionate. I, I've been victimized. I've been a survivor of sexual assault. And, uh, you know, when, when people kind of differentiate between, you know, people who committed sexual offenses should be treated a certain way. I'm like, they're like, well, you, you don't know what that feels like. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I do. But I understand what created that. It doesn't excuse, it gives a reason. And once you understand someone's the complexity of what it means to be human, that compassion, like, like Pam said, begins to sink in. And I think we really saw that uh, with the legislators uh, coming together about Melissa's case, trying to finally get in line uh, with their spiritual values and beliefs. So uh, we would like to hear uh, Carl's letter and uh, poem, if, if that's available. Linda, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. I can barely, can barely hear y'all. Oh, no. Um, let me see. Okay, here's the audience. Hi, this is Linda. You want to introduce who you are? Anything that they need, if they don't have a radio, they don't have, if 
things that they name that they need to, to get it through the day we help them do that so that's our organization and uh, i am a really personal friend of carl but the guy that's going to be executed he's a wonderful man um i know he, and he says i'm not innocent i i know that you know i've done wrong but he said you know i'm old now i'm feeble i don't feel like it's right to execute me but he said if that's god's will then i will go and um, his writing he writes very short letters because his hands are very crippled and so he can't write very well the last letter i got from him he just said hi linda just want you to know i'm thinking of you hand is sore today so it's hard to write but i wanted you to know i hadn't forgotten you love carl and um he's I just feel that, you know, clemency would be right for him. I mean, he knows that he, he doesn't say I want to get out. Although if he could get out, I would bring him to my home right now because I'm not scared of him. I know, you know, and I know what happened. He told me everything that happened. He, he certainly did not set out to kill a police officer, but there was a confrontation and it caused him to fire his gun. And unfortunately he killed the officer. And he's had to live with that for the rest of his life. And it's hard on him. But um, he's, he's just, I just don't want to see him die. But I know that I'm probably going to see him die. But uh, I can hope he's not. He writes some poems. And I think they're really, they're, they're really cute. They're not, you know, real long. But he wrote a poem called The Truth. It needs no introduction. There is no left or right. It hits the mark dead center, creating its own light. Sometimes we call it bitter. Sometimes we call it sweet. Sometimes it lies there hidden behind the shroud deceit. It killed young Martin Luther and another king called Christ. Old Socrates and Moses fell victim to its vice. The cold hard facts are many, like sand upon the shore. The wages of sin is death. You've heard that said before. Our history paints a picture of greed, deceit, and sin. When evil rears its ugly head, sometimes we call it friend. But in our hearts, we know that love will conquer hate. I pray you find the answer before it is too late. Think about it. And then he wrote another point. He, he loved to write. He did like to write poetry, but when his hands got so bad, he just he stopped writing. And another one that he wrote was called Society's Child. This is not one of your average poems about another about mother nature or father time this is about blood sweat and tears and everyone's favorite subject crime a man on a corner begs for a dime the soup kitchen opens he stands in line the homeless forgotten like yesterday's rain so look down your nose stay away from the flame so who points the finger when someone does wrong and who cocks the hammer when all hope is gone he looks so natural that's what they will say it's time for dinner so have a nice day so who shot the man at the hardware store? Was the shooter a crazed, drug out psychopath looking for his, his or her next fix? Or simply society's child operating at the level they were reduced to? For guidance in this matter, look to the mirror, my friend. Will you change things or simply look the other way while your child grows hungry again? Think about it. Carl had a rough life growing up and uh, that doesn't, you know, that's, some people have really bad lives and they, they grow up to be great. Others, it really hurts them really badly. And he did come from a very, very abusive home. And he has a sister now that, you know, we contacted her last week for the first time. And she wants nothing to do with him. And that's hard. I mean, he's, he, you know, he said, I would just like to have seen her before I go and tell her how sorry I am that I, I've, you know, been away this, this way in my life, but she's not going to get that chance. And we're not going to tell him what she said about him because she said he should have been dead a long time ago. So he's got, you know, a lot of bitterness in his family. She's the only one he has left his, both of his brothers are dead. And, uh, of course his parents. So we we're all he had D Danny and me and Barbara are all the man has. And, we just hope that we can see him live longer than next week. Thank, Thank you, Linda. Okay. Thank you so much. 
and we appreciate you being here virtually tonight. Yeah, I've been on death row all day today, so I'm kind of tired. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, the copies of the poems that she wrote are up here if y'all want to take a picture of it. And so I guess, Jennifer, you want to close this out? Yeah, we'll get in the shot so we don't just have your empty chair <laughs> sitting there like you disappeared. Tonight. Well, we, we want to thank everybody for joining us um, tonight. Uh, I felt like we had a really good conversation. And uh, we want to thank the Texas After Violence Project for, for doing the wonderful they work doing the wonderful work that they do uh, to make sure that our, our oral histories and narratives are preserved um, and never whitewashed and, and never forgotten. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Pam. Uh, I love you so much. And as always, uh, Maggie. <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs> uh